While their career paths have been quite different, they all share a common thread when it comes to their beginnings. Each of them started their journey at a young age as home haunters, making nightmares out of whatever props and costumes they could cobble together, just for the sheer pleasure of scaring the crap out of people stopping by at Halloween. Who's ready for some origin stories? Please welcome to the stage. Owner of Sinister Point Productions, Jeff Scheffelbein. <laughs> Special effects technician at Knott's Berry Farm, Jacob Larson. <laughs> Owner of the Terror Haunted House, Bruce Stanton. <laughs> Owner and creative director of Fear Farm, Rick Boker. <laughs> Experiential writer and director, Ted Doherty. <laughs> Director and executive producer of Universal Studios Hollywood's Halloween Horror Nights, John Murdy. <laughs> and your host for this panel presentation, co founder and creative director of Midsummer Scream, Rick West. How you doing, everybody? So I brought some friends. Do you approve? So we're going to blast through this thing because we've got a lot of ground to cover because there's lots of bodies up here, living ones, I will add. Uh, we all know what these guys do pretty much current day, but I thought it would be really cool to delve into their origin stories. How do you guys feel about that? Is that cool? All right. All right. Then away we are going to go. We're going to start with Mr. Jeff Sheffelmine. That's a lifetime ago, right? Yeah, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, it was. Well, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about what you do these days, but then immediately bounce into what got you into the whole Halloween thing, and, and how did your haunting start? That's a lot. Um, what am I doing today? Um, well, right now, this, uh, this October, I'm working with Creep uh, to bring everyone the new Ghosts. Uh, production with CBS, so that's happening. Uh, so we're putting that together, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, a lot of other small productions, we're getting ready to open a new uh, themed speakeasy. We've already got a themed speakeasy in Montclair that we opened last year. Um, so yeah, things have been a little hectic and busy on that realm. Um, still running and operating the Ghostly Retreat, the Haunted Mansion Airbnb. If you guys haven't checked that out, it's here in Fullerton. It's incredible. It's a lot of fun. And um, and then, what else going back now? Is that what we're doing? Let's talk about in the beginning. Oh God, in the beginning. Well, here, let's see in this picture. Uh, that is a 36 foot spinning tunnel that I built in my front yard, in my parents' front yard, when I was 15 years old. The neighbors hated us. Hated us. Um, yeah, and this was actually I like. There were so many more pictures. Like, what happened was devastating. I remember this specifically. We had a huge windstorm, and everything then. Well, I was using drywall for everything, and this big windstorm came and just demoed everything. We came out the next morning. I was crying, and everything was all like all the plastic was ripping down the street, and you know all the neighbor kids. Everybody came over, and everyone's helped patching everything back up together. And, and Halloween, like, everybody had your shit at their house. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's like you keep your shit on uh, your lawn. No, <laughs> um, yeah, and then it, it just uh, grew from there. Um, when I was 18, I opened my very first commercial haunted house, um, rented a, a warehouse space, and I remember my my uncle loaned me like 10 grand to like get started and sign the lease and. Uh, and I think that's that picture. That's my very first commercial haunt up in the corner. We were charging six bucks for admission, right? We're hoping uh, that comes back. <laughs> um, right. Okay, help me out of the job. 
Um, but yeah, uh, we were doing that, and uh, that was that was the beginning, man. That's that's when we started. It was, and it was nonstop since then. It was that's, I, you know, when I knew that's what I wanted to do, and it it was just it exploded, and it was so crazy back then because conventions and Halloween, uh, it was there, there was no such thing as this. You know, it, it didn't exist. So if you saw anything or a, a prop somewhere, it was like, it was it was amazing. Like, oh my God, where did that come from? Who made this? You know, it wasn't accessible as it, as it used to be. Um, but now it is, and I, I mean, the, the, the thought that, and the, the idea that everybody can do this now, it, it wasn't so hard back then, and now we have everything we need. Props, lighting, sound, special effects. Like, you know, and it's it's just so cool, and the creativity level and everything has come so far, yeah. and uh, it's given the ability for people to do amazing things. And even for me, I mean, I am so out of it now, and, and I come and see all this stuff now, and I see what people are doing, I'm like, God, I'm glad I'm like not really doing this too much anymore, because I cannot compete with this shit. Like, <laughs> you guys are like set levels like above and beyond, it's amazing. Um, yeah, these pictures are like, some of that's from, uh, Airbnb, and then I think that's your picture, right? That you took. Uh, that was probably my, that was one of my haunts that I did. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a fun ride. It's um, it's a tough ride. It's uh, I mean, it's not easy. It's been very hard. I mean, it's like gambling. I mean, some years you're doing a haunt, and you know, you come out and you think you're just like back in the day, like we were rich. You know, I was like, oh my god, I made thirty thousand dollars. You know, I was like a twenty year old. You know, in like two weeks, two or three weeks. And uh, it, was, it was a different time, yeah. but um, things have gotten tougher. But yeah. it, it's, it was a, it's been a great ride, and I love doing it, and I hope it never stops. How many people grew up going to Sinister Point? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Loved it, and thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So Jacob, when when did you get bitten by the Halloween bug, and, and when did you decide I'm going to be more than just a casual fan of this stuff? Uh, well, I mean, I grew up like in the Haunt family. I mean, my dad moved into our house in 1999, started the Haunted House, and then I was born in 2004. So I mean, instantly I was thrown into acting. He was constantly making positions for me that I could go scare, and then that would go to, okay, well now try painting this technique, or build this, build that. Um, yeah, and I just grew up doing that. I always remember going to the fair, too, and like, that spooky dark ride that would yeah. be there that like, had nothing in it. It yeah. was like, not very great, but I would get the unlimited wristband and just go on that all day. And that was like my favorite thing. Um, but yeah, I just always had a, a love and appreciation of like, spooky things. Um, yeah, and as I continued to grow up, I uh, just began to get more and more interested in the building of them and the creation of them. So, um, I remember in the bottom right picture, uh, there was a drop panel that I remember building with my dad, like, uh, when I was that age, obviously. But, uh, yeah, just getting more into it, getting to create it, and then, uh, then in 2020, I would say is when I really stepped into getting more involved in the haunt. You can see that picture on the left is taken. Uh, when we did Pirates Cave Origins, uh, which was our show in 2020, uh, when the pandemic hit. But uh, yeah, just got involved. Uh, just really appreciation for uh, supportive parents and uh, neighbors and all that, and just having a great cast of crew to support us go the whole month. How many people here got to see Pirates Cave? <laughs> Unbelievable home haunt, fantastic home haunt. I was blown away when I saw it the first time. And uh, I think it's fantastic that that your dad was so involved with you doing that. Oh, that's, that's a blessing. He's here today, too. Cool. So, Where are you at, Dan? Nice. So then you made a you made a little jump. You made a jump from the old Pirates Cave to uh, a ghost town, huh? Yeah. So um, the last year we operated Pirates Cave was 2021. Uh, so in that year, um, we had somebody come out from Knotts who was very interested in uh, me and the haunt that we created. And I just I basically called Pirates Cave like a living portfolio for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, got to show that off and really show what I could do and. Uh, Somebody from North came out, was very interested, and ended up 
carrying me on. Uh, and I was still 17 at the time, actually, when we were doing Pirates Game 2021. So I uh, ended up going through some series of meetings, and uh, they literally interviewed me. At least they couldn't interview me because I was not 18 yet. They interviewed me two days after my 18th birthday. And I started in special effects. You're making us feel really freaking old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I, I'm afraid of wetting myself up here while you're talking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, no. I no. But yeah, um, just, yeah, since then I've been in Oz for the past uh, like two and a half years. Uh, I've been in special effects. So, got to work on a lot of really cool projects. I mean, we not only work on Scare Farm, we work on every seasonal event you guys see at the farm. Uh, so, but yeah, these are a collection of all the stuff I've gotten to work on. Uh, on the left is a picture from the big fin finale monster you saw in Cinema Slasher last year. Uh, that was a creation from me and my team. Uh, and then the Chainsaw from Cinema Slasher and all that. But yeah, I just love it. And, uh, and Scary Farm is a huge event, and I would always go when I was a kid and start going 2015 and just stop here. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I started in 1981. <laughs> 2015. <laughs> Keep going, Jacob. I know, but I was in like middle school at that time, so it's oh, still yeah. pretty daunting for me at least. So I'm sorry, everybody else. Yeah, let's see. Uh, but yeah, uh, I remember going through Paranormal Link that first year that it was open, and that was the first ever like professional hot maze I went through, and it was just completely blown away. Um, but yeah, just getting to see that and continue going every year, I was just I knew that was some place I wanted to end up. Uh, but yeah, just been. Been there ever since and loving it. Um, yeah, I've been doing all sorts of projects now. Well, it's so. awesome. And it's awesome that we all get to go see your handiwork. I think that's pretty badass, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. How many Reign of Terror fans are in the audience? <laughs> Bruce, what, what a lot of people may not know is that Reign of Terror actually started in your front yard, as a home haunt. I had never seen these pictures, so when Bruce sent them over, I was like, oh, this is gold, this is like really, really cool. And kind of weird to see the sign in, in a front yard instead of in the, you know, in the building in Thousand Oaks. So Bruce, tell us your origin story, man. So if you've been to the haunt house, you would see that Reign of Terror arch we still use, yes. that it's kind of homage to the fact that it started as a home haunted house. Uh, my story is, I mean, I think all of ours are, are very similar in the passion and the love for Halloween, but mine's just a little bit different in the sense that I grew up in the late 70s in Culver City, and I went through a haunted house that was some, someone put together, it was just a little walkthrough, and they had opened up an entire house, and I was just enamored of what they did done. And exactly like what Jeff had talked about, or Jack had talked about, you know, in the 70s and 80s, you know, maybe there was a rubber hand or something of that nature, but <laughs> none of this stuff existed. So it was the simplest of things, just I thought was so cool. Uh, I started doing a little yard display at my parents' house in the late 80s, and then I went to college and graduated from college, and it wasn't until I bought a house in Thousand Oaks in 2000 that it was like, okay, all bets are off, let's get this thing rolling. <laughs> so, what I, the fact that the basis of going through someone's home I thought was so cool, and that's what, I, that's what really kind of started me being able to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this to the max. If you look at this one picture, you can see the front facade of the house. So it's a track home built in the 70s. It was 1,500 square feet. The last year I had done it in my house, the haunted house itself was 2,000 square feet. <laughs> because there was so much built in the garage or in the driveway along the side of the house and the back of the house. One story I love telling is, I mean, I was so committed to this that in my master bedroom, which was in the back of the house, there was a big slider window. Well, I built stairs to come through the window. Well, that wasn't going to work, so the next year I took the window out and put in French doors so you could come through for the haunted house. I, mean, I don't tell people that. I say, ah, oh, you know, it'd be better value, easier, be a better access. But the reality is it was so you could come through the haunted house. So the last year I had done it at the house, we went from one night to two nights to four nights. Uh, we did 4,400 people. We had a little clicker. And like a lot of situations, it's the, the neighbors, the city, the police, everyone was just like, you know, we love this, but you just can't do it anymore. So the reign of terror really is, I'm like, I'm along for the ride. I, I never in my wildest dreams thought it would be what it is today. In fact, I sell dental implants. <laughs> that's my career. That, that's, that's another type of terror. So that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's what I do. I mean, I'm a, I sell dental implants. I've been doing that for 25 years. This truly is a passion. But I think it's because of that passion 
that we always make sure everything is done to the best because it's all for us and for you guys. So, I mean, Jeff talked about making 10,000. I mean, we spent 10,000 on a prop, a prop. So, and it's, that, that, gen, that journey has been so fantastic and so rewarding. And it's all that attention to detail. It's like, could, could we get away with one speaker? Yes. Could we get away with five lights? Yes. But four speakers and 10 lights is better. And that's just the model that we've always had. And we've kind of been going along and expanding in different facilities. But you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that it's permanently set up, which is a huge advantage that we have, because we work on it all year. And people ask, I mean, you know, when do you start? You start it next month. We never stop. I mean, it is, it's the hobby, it's what we love doing. So if you've been before, you see that detail, and, and we do it just because we love it. And we appreciate everyone who comes through. We hope to continue to do it for years and years, but it's uh, really been a fantastic ride. Uh, there's one picture here of the two bodies laying on a table. You, know, you start developing connections in the industry, and people reach out. Those bodies actually came from Dexter. So if you watch the show oh, Dexter, oh, so it's like, you know, their hand-punched hair, and it's it, it just top-notch. But that's me for shooting foam. I mean, I have my hand in kind of everything that we do, so I make sure that it fits our standard and the quality is there, and if it's not going to be there, then we're just not going to do it because we don't ever want someone to come by and go, ah, it wasn't that good. So awesome. thank you guys. Awesome. awesome. I was so proud. Look, yeah, you look, you look something. Yeah. So, I remember that day, I was building a tree house. I'm sure you were. Okay. First and foremost, if you guys have been in the Hall of Shadows, Rick and his team, Fear Farm, created our entryway, Dust Ball Hall. And you know, I, I say to him every year, if only you guys could make your structures a little bit bigger. You know, because they're hard to see. And, you know. But no, Rick, he has made consistently the largest structures we have had, like every year in the Hall of Shadows for the past several years. You know, last year was the giant castle, if you'll remember that. And then the year before that, it was the narrow, really, really tall castle in, in the corner. Right, right. castles. Yes, well, castles are good. And uh, so it was a no-brainer to ask Rick and his team to do our entry portal into the Hall of Shadows this year, and uh, if I don't say so myself, it's pretty badass, sir. Thanks so much. So let's talk. You you are you reign from the, the high desert. Let, let's talk about when you started getting into Halloween and, and the whole haunt scene. So um, actually, it started in Chino. Actually, oh, everything or, starts in Chino. It all starts in Chino. <laughs> Yeah, um, so my uh, my cousins and my uncle and stuff, they, they had a neighborhood where they had a lot of like trick-or-treaters and stuff like that going on. And uh, we uh, one year we uh, we did a tarp and strobe light. That was like the whole haunted house. I think I wore a ghost sheet as like my, my costume and I had a train horn. That was the only scare in the whole thing. And uh, I was six years old at the time and it's just exploded since then. You know, it was just every year it, it was like, okay, it's more than a porch, it becomes the backyard, then it's the backyard, the garage, the porch, and then it's like, okay, you know, we, when we moved to the property where all of these pictures were taken, it just kind of, it was more, it was, we had like two and a half acres of land, it's like a farm, like setting out there, so we started building and building and just over, you know, years and years and years and stuff, it just accumulated into something that was just huge, and of course, like a lot of these other guys, like, neighbors complaining and dealing with city and stuff like that you know trying trying to be as legit as you can but like you, you can't please everybody you know it just started it just grew and grew and grew still and people were, were getting more so this year we're moving to a, a new facility you know in corona all right so uh we got 200 acres on a paintball airsoft field that's so, the first time in years anybody has said corona and gotten cheers <laughs> so, so that's that's Poor great corona. yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but uh, I mean, it, you know, like a lot of these guys said, like in the early days, it was, I mean, that castle right there was made out of cardboard. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, it was I, literally I, made out of cardboard. The fire marshal wasn't joking either. Yeah, he wasn't joking either. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, that maze was maybe 500 square feet tops, and we had massive crowd just for, just for it. And that really, like, made us feel like, you know, hey, we got something here. We got to keep doing it for the community. And we kept getting more and more monsters. I think one year we had, like, 75 monsters, like, on the team. And uh, for a home hop, that's a lot of monsters. <laughs> you know? Yeah, for anyone, that's a lot of monsters. Yeah, that's a lot of monsters. So we, we were doing that, and, you know, it just, it just, it just grew, you know. I mean, every year it just we, we were trying to one up each other. Or, or last year, ever like, okay, we did that last year. Let's let's. How do we one up it? And then we started adding things like we did a hayride. You know, we were literally trying to fill it with a with a lawnmower at, at first. I'm not even gonna lie. Like we had a long, ride on lawnmower. Like it was a bigger one, but we put a little tiny wagon behind it to hold like three or four people in it. And we we were like, okay, we broke the lawnmower, and then we we bought a we bought an old Ford tractor, which we still use today. And uh, yeah, like it's it's just something that's been growing. That's great. That's awesome. And, and you're you're making the jump to further south in the Southern California region, in, into Corona, into the Inland Empire. So where in, where exactly? Like like you you went from your your property out out in the desert to is it is it like a field or I mean what what, what is the the property now that you're moving into? So when we when we decided we were going to move, it was a tough decision because we really liked the vibe of like a place you come up a two mile dirt road and everything. People always tell me, oh, the scariest part of your house is the, the scariest part is getting there. there. <laughs> it's getting there. Yeah. Yes. And we're like, okay, we want to capture that vibe, you know, but we don't want to. We don't. We have to obviously expand and do stuff more legitimately and, and everything like that. But we, we want to keep that vibe. So we found this, the place in Corona actually does have, like when you enter the place, you go through like a tunnel of trees. And, and, and there's like, it, it's a dirt parking lot and it still has a lot of the same vibe. You know, a lot of landscaping and stuff is there. Um, that made, made it worth doing, we think. You know, it's like, it's okay. We, we can bring our vibe that we've been building for 25 years we've been doing this and put it into something else and still keep the charm that was the idea you know so yeah it's it's a uh, it's a little scary a little nerve-wracking but uh we're doing it yeah awesome i'll plug one more time if you haven't somehow made it to the hollow shadows yet Make sure you go see it before we close today because it's a spectacle and it's all kicked off by Fear Farm. Thank you. What? What? Why was that castle pink? Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Um, I will bring that up. This sounds like a story. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, get, get this. this. Get this. So that castle that we were talking about. It was actually a parade float because my mom used to do pageants, like she, she ran a company like beauty pageants, and we built this thing. So we painted it to be scary <laughs> or scary-ish. The dream is gone. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yes. A horror pageant. Okay. All right. Ted Doherty, ladies and gentlemen. Ted is certainly no stranger to the industry, and everybody that's into the industry certainly has heard of Ted in one way or another. Ted, let's talk about in the beginning for you, man. Absolutely. Well, my experience with home hunting goes way, way back. Uh, but real quick, my mom is a huge Halloween and horror movie fan. My dad, not so much. He tolerates it, uh, but he's a professional musician, and so we were definitely raised in the world of the arts. It's my younger sister, myself, my older brother, and so the idea for a, a home hunt came from my older brother and uh, my mom. Uh, my brother at the time was like a preteen. I was six years old. My little sister was one years old, and uh, this was very much kind of a family affair, so when we think about like the great home hunts in our area of like Rotten Apple and stuff where everybody's participating, that's what uh, this was. And so uh, it, it was a full on walk through home hunt through my parents' home and all the way out to the backyard. My brother and uh, my mom uh, kind of worked out the logistics and came up with the idea of, of Castle Dracula. And it was theatrically driven. So way before things like Delusion and Creep, um, which is probably why I'm a fan of such those amazing uh, attractions. But if you think about like 
the, the famous like independent haunts in the 70s and 80s of like the campus life haunted houses and the JC haunted houses. A lot of them had like an in-character host who would guide the small groups through the house. That's what this kind of was. Now, uh, we didn't take a lot of photos of any of this stuff. It didn't occur to us. So like something like Jacob, you know, you've got like videos, you've got like all this stuff. Jacob's got digital pictures. I know, I took photos of your, your home hunt. So, uh, so what we saw here is, is pretty much uh, what we got. My mom made this rad flyer that went out to the neighborhood. I yeah. Dude. It's fun that you have that still. How cool is that? I love yeah, that. That's that so neat. Me mom. Yeah. If so, uh, we just went out to the neighbors. Uh, one of the neighbor moms greeted guests at the front of the driveway. Small groups of guests went up to the front door, rang the bell, and my brother answered the door, and he was Quasimodo, and he was quietly inviting everybody in the castle driveway into the first room, which was the dungeon, which was my parents' living room. And he was having everybody be quiet because he didn't want to wake the master, because right there, asleep in his coffin, was six-year-old me, the star of the show. And so I like, pretended to be asleep in my coffin, which was actually my parents' sofa. So everybody kind of tiptoed past me into the hall, into my little sister's room, which was decorated to look like a witch's kitchen. And that's where my mom was, as dressed as a, a witch, cackling, engaging everybody. Uh, my little one-year-old sister was in her crib, and my mom decorated that to look like an oven. So she's cooking the kids. She's threatening to, to, to cook everybody. So she shoots the group away by throwing Halloween candy at them. So everybody's frantically like picking up Halloween candy, and then uh, they're led into Frankenstein's laboratory, which was the dining room, and so there was a body on the slab, which was the dining room table with a white sheet and lab equipment. Dr. Frankenstein was a neighborhood friend, and he engaged with the guests, and then ultimately, uh, Quasimodo led everyone into the backyard where my dad was waiting, uh, and he was dressed as a grave digger. He was holding on a leash, uh, our family dog, Easy. She was awesome. And he, but he's also holding a, a fishing line that was rigged to the tree, and at the right moment, he'd drop a ghost on everybody, so everybody flipped out. And then Quasimodo led everyone to the rear portion of the yard where the, the shed was, and that was decorated like a fortune teller tent, and that's where my wonderful Auntie Wynn was there. She was serious as Zelda, invited everybody in to read fortunes, and they kind of got quiet, intimate, reading their palms or whatever, and then out of nowhere, bam, on the side of this metal shed was Count Dracula, six-year-old me, scaring the crap out of everybody, furious that you're in my castle, now I'm going to kill all of you, and so Quasimodo just yells, run, and so I chased everybody out uh, the side of the house and into uh, the front driveway, and that was our home haunt of Castle Dracula. Oh. Okay, so then after the, the, the extravaganza that was Castle Dracula, Ted grew and got older and started getting into different things in, into the industry. How did that progress for you? Well, um, we only did that home haunt one year because, you, as any home hunter knows, I mean, it's a lot of work. And, and so most of the family kind of checked out of, of that. But once I uh, got more into my pre-teens, I was doing more of like traditional yard displays with like tombstones and bodies and like lighting and um, you know cheesecloth is kind of my like best knockoff of not a scary farm uh, but then eventually uh, I didn't transition until much much later on uh, once I became a monster many many years later at not scary farm and then kind of worked my way up there and then uh, wrote a book about not scary farm and then you know, and eventually got to work with some great people here in the industry and uh, get to do things like the Lionsgate maze and the Hall of Shadows. Yeah! And all that. Yeah. So, yeah, that kind of brings me up to date. Yeah. I just got to point out, some of the most iconic mazes in recent years at Not Scary Farm, which would qualify as ever at Not Scary Farm, Ted has had a hand in. You know, Origins, the 50th anniversary maze, like, amazing, amazing stuff, and I'm sure there are a few people in here that have your book, yes? <laughs> yeah, so really good stuff, and tell me just a little bit, tell all of us, actually, what, what you did at the beginning with the, with the Lionsgate project here. What? The, lion, the Lionsgate thing. Oh, yeah. So that little that, thing in the Hall of Shadows. Yeah, so I do a lot of work with uh, Play Productions and John Cook, and so we teamed up with Lionsgate, and they're a great team of people, and uh, really kind of went over their, their library of like really amazing uh, 
movies, horror movies, and kind of uh, whittled it down to what we kind of thought uh, was the best, and, um, and kind of, it was a collaboration of doing like Saw, and like Cabin in the Woods, and the upcoming Crow movie, and stuff like that, so really kind of working on all of that, and well, you know what it's like to bring horror movies to, to, to life, and a, a thing or two about <laughs> He's that. He's dabbled. He's dabbled in it. So it's it it pretty much like that, just working closely with those folks and kind of working every step of the way, making sure everything was uh, on board and uh, had a lot of fun working with a great cast uh, that we've trained really well. And uh, I think uh, it's been well received so far. So we guys don't know the Lion's <laughs> If you haven't made sure you do it, we didn't get to say our, our welcome to everybody yesterday. So I, what I was going to say then is that the Hall of Shadows in itself, these home haunters and the pro haunters, really just bust their asses to bring these haunts to Long Beach every year. And last year when we had Wicker Manor from Colorado, I was like, well, that was crazy. That'll never happen again. And then suddenly here we are a year later where the Lionsgate project was, was in partnership with Clay Productions. And it was fabricated, it was designed and fabricated in Georgia, and then packed up onto two semi trucks and trucked 2,000 miles across the United States here to Long Beach, just for you guys this weekend. So that's really special, and we're very, very proud of that. Thank you, Ted, for having a part of that. Thank you. And Jacob helped us out big time, too. Yes, he so, did. He yeah. was in there building stuff. I got to do the special effects for it, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. amazing. So great. All right. And here we go. So we 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 look. We we've, we've heard for years. You you have reference that you started you know as as a home haunter, but then that's kind of it. It was just like the tease that kind of went on for 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 years. So now I have you here, and I thought it would be great. Everybody wants to hear John's origin story, right? All right. That's the makeup. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start with the picture in the bottom corner. Uh, so 1977, I was 10 years old in a movie called Star Wars that had just come out that summer. Um, and I'm trying to remember why we did this, because it's the dumbest idea <laughs> ever. Like, let's take Star Wars and make a haunted, you know, home haunt, a haunted house. But, um, is anybody alive when Star Wars came out in the, in the audience? Okay, I don't know, for any of you that, like, today, you know, if you grew up with Star Wars, you'd be like, oh, Star Wars is so huge, and there's, you know, you could buy just about you know, anything you could imagine with Star Wars on it. That wasn't the case in 1977. Um, you know, that movie was passed on by every studio in Hollywood. Um, they, they made a deal for the Kenner, you know, the action figures, but they couldn't bring them to market on time. Do you guys remember this? You had to actually, like, you sent them money. <laughs> I still have this somewhere. And they sent you an IOU. Like, you know, when we make these toys, we will send them to you. But you, you couldn't buy costumes beyond, I think Ben Cooper might have had, you know, the little plastic masks with the rubber band. But we decided we wanted to do a Star Wars, like, home haunt in 1977, so we had to make everything ourselves. And I think my brother Dan is here somewhere. He's C-3PO. He's over there. <laughs> um, you know, I was, I'm the sand person, so that mask was made out of chicken wire with like burlap, and, and um, those are Dixie cups with silver contact paper. Um, I couldn't see shit. <laughs> you know, imagine like looking, and I was chasing Dan with that, I think that was, a rake where I took the end of the rake off, and I was ch Dan was C-3PO, and I was chasing him around, you know, trying to whack him with a stick. And um, we had uh, this guy who was really into Star Wars, who was a friend of ours, who built a whole Darth Vader costume, and he built lightsabers, and he used vacuum tubes, and he melted the ends of them, and he somehow he screwed them onto a flashlight with a little gel, and he also had this is '77, so like synthesizers were just like in their infancy he had like an early synthesizer so the thing that was ridiculous about this is he had to fight my brother uh, Dave who was Luke Skywalker he had to do the classic fight but he had to work the synthesizer to make the sound effects <laughs> so he's 
He's got one hand going, you know, pew, 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 and he's got the other hand doing this. Um, it was really more like a show. You came into the like the entrance of our house in Hacienda Heights, where we grew up, and um, people came in and they saw this like maybe five, ten minute show, and then they left. Um, but th so the next year, I went to my dad and I was like, okay. <laughs> So it's August 1st. You can't park the car in the garage, you know. And we started, with my brother Dan, we started like taking over more and more of my parents' house. I think the picture, the biggest picture, is the last year we did it. So, because we only did it four years. And um, it was 1980. And um, I was jumping out of a, in the bathroom, I was jumping out with a, a butcher knife. So I just went to, Let's see, I need a butcher knife. You couldn't, you were mentioning this, you guys were all mentioning this back then. Jacob, you weren't, because you weren't alive. <laughs> <laughs> but you couldn't buy anything back in those days. You, you know what I'm talking about, Bruce. You couldn't buy a rubber knife, you know. So I just went, oh, there's a butcher knife. So I had a real butcher knife. Um, my friend was running around with a real axe. Um, we all had real knives, real. And um, we were going through the whole house. Um, and into the back, into the into the garage, we built a pit and a pendulum. And then in the backyard, we built a, a black and white checker room with a strobe, that old classic haunted house. And then it was around the backyard that I dug up my dad's whole garden to build that graveyard. Um, and my dad was sitting there, and there was like hundreds of people lined up, you know, because it became a big deal that we did these haunted houses. And I was standing there, getting all ready to go, and I had a butcher knife, and my dad looked at me, and then he looked outside and he went, we're going to be sued. <laughs> you can't do this anymore. And that's when he finally shut it down. But my, my grandmother um, was always a witch. Even in Star Wars, she was a witch. <laughs> she owned her own witch costume, which I've never, she's long, you know, passed away back in the 90s. I've never understood why she owned a witch costume. Mine too. Did she? My really? grandmother always owned a witch costume. Where, where? She was a witch every year, no matter what. Where was she from? Like, what, like culturally, was she like uh, Italian? She, she was from. Okay. Uh, she was from Italy. Yeah. My grandmother Sorry. was um, from. Uh, her family was from, I think Transylvania. Honestly, oh. She's, her maiden name was Zaleski, and she was um, definitely Hungary, Eastern Europe, but. Um, she didn't like giving kids candy. Oh. So she just scared the crap out of them. Um, and no one, so at the end of the night, no one ever had any candy. She would sit there and, and scare, and she, when we were kids, like when I was like neighborhood friends, and um, my dad finally just said that hey, we can't do this anymore and shut me down. So um, the next year, somebody called my parents that was doing, I don't know if you call it a pro hunt, it was like for charity. It was in the Whitwood Plaza um, shopping center in Whittier. It was like a store, and they were and they called my dad. They're like, "Hey, is your son that kid that you know? Can we borrow him?" And I was 14, 14, maybe 15. Um, so I did my first like it wasn't really professional, but it, you know, I did my first haunt when I was I guess 14 or 15 years old. All right, and then and then things kind of progressed for you. And that brings us to present day. How did, how did, how did you go from the, the, the mall and being borrowed by, by folks to uh, running probably the most popular and well-known large-scale haunt in the world? Um, I was in college um, and I was a theater major. I was an acting um, major. And then I got into writing. I started producing my own plays in college. But um, right when it was getting towards the end of college, um, one of my buddies went to Universal Studios Hollywood and auditioned to be a tour guide. And he was like, hey, you should, you should come like, be a tour guide. And so I went, okay. And so in 1989, I auditioned to be a tour guide. And um, only like after working there maybe two years, they were looking for a production assistant or a gopher um, to work on the whole downstairs of the theme park. So like the Starway Escalator, but specifically for me, and it was before E.T. was even built. Um, it was the old special effects show, The World of Cinema Magic. So I, I uh, worked there as a, as a PA on Cinema Magic. And then at the end of the project, um, I, I got a pink slip. <laughs> 
which means you're not going to work there anymore. Because um, it was just, it was just, you know, back in those days, they didn't keep a huge staff. They, it wasn't like it is today. Um, but the guy I worked for um, goes, I can't hire you, but there's a company in Marina Del Rey called KBD, or Kevin Biles Design KBD Innovative Arts. Um, they're starting up a theme park division. Why don't you go interview? I did that, got that job, worked there five years, and by the time I left there, I went back to Universal in 96 to work for Universal Creative to write one one freelance show, um, and I and, I, and it just kept hiring me and hiring me, and eventually brought me on. So I was um, I worked for Creative for years and did you know the Mummy Ride in Hollywood and the Studio Tour and a whole bunch of other projects. And we were relocated to Orlando um, in 2002 when they moved the whole division to Orlando. And then one day the phone rang, and it was the general manager of the park, and he said, oh, we're thinking of bringing Horror Nights back. Um, but I'd already like established myself as, a, as designing rides, and, and so I rock, paper, scissored with my wife, because um, we were leaving to go get married in Ireland like that day. And um, I said, okay, let's go, rock, paper, scissors, and, and wow. Always bet on rock. Rock always wins. She took rock, I did. Um, and so we said, okay, we're, we're going to do Hornets. And that was, it was literally decided by rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> How many home haunters or, or people that, that, that decorate their homes and, and kind of think, well, one of these days I'd like to do a pro thing. How many, how many of you are here in the audience? So you guys are out there. We see you. So I'd like to go down the line just real quick, and and if you could if you could pass on, you know, words of advice or and, and they can't be don't do it. That that's easy. Yeah, no. I saw, I saw your face, and that was it. Um, what what would you what would you tell people that uh, are embarking on their own on, on their own journeys? What 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 would you suggest that they look out for things that they strive for and things that have helped work you know on your on your journey as well. Um, uh, I mean, things are changing so quick. So, I mean, just over a matter of the past 10 years, I think things have gotten tougher doing, doing pro haunts. Um, city regulations, the cost is astounding. Like everything, like there's so many challenges now, but, um, but I think ultimately is if you're creative, be creative, be you and do something that changes everything. I mean, and, and we're seeing that more and more every day. Back in the day, it was, you know, everybody did haunts and they all had their skeletons hanging and they all had their, you know, their cut off hands and their da 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 like, but now everybody is doing something different and just keep doing it. Just keep changing the game and you will be successful. And I think that's what you gotta do. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. You're up and coming home hunters, the cheap lumber section at the Home Depot. Yeah. 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 Lumber's expensive nowadays. Uh, but no, I mean, home haunts are a great way for you to just learn lots of different areas of what we do in the industry. I mean, all the different production crafts, the creative ends. So get involved with the haunt. I mean, if, you, if it's not in your will to start your own, maybe ask somebody in the hall of shadow, hey, can I be a part of your haunt? Because I'm sure they'll say yes. They always need hands, trust me. Ask Rex too. We always need hands to put these productions together. So go out there and get your hands dirty, find what you like and what you're doing out in there, and you'll find what you really want to hone in on, and one day you may end up here on the stage with us. So yeah, you never know. I mean, the, the, the passion behind it is definitely going to be key. I mean, obviously there's a ton of passion up here. Uh, bigger is not better, flat out. You know, right. do something that's within your control. Uh, we got our start. I mean, like I said, it was a home haunted house, and the city basically came to me and said, we love what you're doing, but you can't do it anymore for all these reasons. But we would love for you to do it for us. So we're going to provide you a space. So for 12 years of a professional haunted house, I didn't pay a dime in rent. Now, we live in California. That is unheard of. But that's because there was a partnership. There was, there was a value that we were able to uncover. I mean, most people might not realize this, but I mean, we're a non-profit haunted house. 
way we donate our money towards the city, we've now transitioned over to a lot of animal rescues and stuff like that, but we're giving hundreds of thousands of dollars to different charity events because I love doing this. And I truly think that model is still available for someone else to capitalize on it. The key is, is you gotta make sure you keep control. Don't get involved with a committee, don't get involved with someone where this person's gonna do this or this or that. That's where you're gonna go south. It's your passion that's gonna make all the difference. But like I said, I think that the model is successful because it is incredibly expensive in California. Thanks for coming, you don't, don't start out in California. <laughs> If you want to be scary, put your grandma on the porch with, uh, with a witch costume on, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's the end. Yeah. <laughs> no, like, 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 for real though, if you want to do this, love it first and find ways to keep loving it. Find new things, new avenues that keep you just inspired to just be the best that you can be. Because if you get bored with it, you're going to see it in the quality of your attraction. And, uh, that's kind of always been our motto with our team, you know, and be really grateful to all the people that help you and stick by you and stay with those people. And yeah, that's, that's where, that's what I live by. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I guess my two cents would be, you're at the right place. Growing up, we did not have a midsummer screen. We did not have things like that at all. Like there, you could not like you could go to school and like major in themed entertainment and stuff like that. Um, you know, so so I think uh, there's so many opportunities here for you to learn, to educate yourself, kind of find out what works, what doesn't. Um, Jacob, kind of like what you were saying too with Rick's kid as well as like, I mean, it's just, there's so many opportunities in the Hall of Shadows just to be able to go in there and be inspired and kind of see what people are doing and you can kind of try to implement some of that stuff um, uh, at your home and, and just try to develop it. The main thing that is, is definitely gonna be the, the constant is the passion and just to care and really kind of, for me, it's always just been really like, you almost have to become obsessed with it and and just drive 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 to get it done and just do the very very best that you can and that's all you can do and just keep loving it common thread you, you've heard a lot of people say this passion that's like so important um you have to find the passion in, in everything you're doing or there's no reason to do it um, but I, as far as advice, I'm going to go back to what my father told me um, when I was just, you know, um, getting out of college, really. Um, and my dad is, um, he's a, you know, he was a businessman. He didn't have a creative bone in his body. And he didn't know what to tell his kooky son or any of his sons, because my brothers are musicians, you know. Um, he didn't know what to tell us. But he, he told me something that was extremely valuable that I have since told countless uh, people that I've met, you know, at places like this or at the event, and that is whatever you're doing in life, no matter what it is, do it to the best of your ability. You could be flipping fries at McDonald's, be the best damn fry flipper at McDonald's. And, and the reason is because quality rises to the surface, that's how you get noticed, and that way people will recommend you for something else. Now, when I look back, at the entire trajectory of my career, I can find a million examples of that. Um, you know, when you're going through life, you're gonna find that there's these moments, these forks in the road where you can turn left or you can turn right, and it's gonna make all the difference. But you're not gonna know it at the time, right? You're only gonna know it through hindsight. Um, but every step of the way I mentioned, I you know got a job, I thought, oh, I'm in, I'm a production assistant. Oh, I'm not, here's a pink slip. But the guy, I worked work my ass off on that project. The guy who worked for me recommended me for the next step. That guy ended up being at Universal, who hired me back when I needed to get back to Universal. So every single step of the way it was because somebody recommended me. And there's kids that I met at the Horror Nights when they were with their parents when they were 10 years old or 12 years old or 14, and I've told them the same thing. And those are the people who are now working for us. You know, those are the, those are the kids who made it because they took that advice to heart, and no matter what they did, they did their absolute best, and they did it with passion.
So I've had the absolute pleasure of, of knowing each of these guys up here, in some cases for decades. And I've, I've been as, as supportive as I could have possibly been over the past umpteen million years that, that, that I've been involved with, with haunts and haunters. And it just, it, it never gets old. And I'm, and I'm always proud to see up and coming haunters really spread their wings and take off. And I love cheering on my, my, my more seasoned friends in their amazing accomplishments as they continue to just kick doors open and just kick ass in this industry and become, I mean, we are the world example of, of what Halloween is and what horror attractions are. And really here in Southern California, this, this is ground zero for that. And I've always said that, and I will always say that. Um, and so on behalf of myself and of course, everybody here, thank you guys so much. No, thank you guys. Because if it wasn't for all of you that support all of our work, God knows where we would have ended up. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yes. So, perseverance, passion, and having your grandmother with a witch costume. That's right. Scaring the shit out of everybody every Halloween. That's the way to do it, folks. That's our little spook show for this afternoon. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your time at Midsummer Spree. Thank you very much, everybody. At this time.